Okay, why don't we get started? Um, I know it's Thanksgiving week, so um, usually lighter attendance. So if you're here in person or online, that means you have more chances to ask questions if you have them. Um, so before we begin our lecture, um, are there any questions about either the course material or course logistics moving forward? There is class on Wednesday, at least I will be here. <laughs> You, I mean, you know, I, I know some colleges have all week off, but uh, the UCs don't tend to do that. Or um, So there will be class, um, and we'll do our best, obviously, to zoom it and record it. But obviously, you know, you know um, technology, if there's technical issues, then um, we can only guarantee so much. Um, and um, this is the second to last week of class. There will be one more week of classes next week. And then following that is final week. And there's no final in this class, but there is that final project. So if you're presenting why you would need to be at that final exam session. Um, and even if you're not, you can come out and support your classmates, okay? Um, as I mentioned last time, there are, uh, because of the current situation, um, the grading of the, the homeworks that have already been turned in is sort of paused. I, I'm gonna wait to see if things change in the next week or so. Uh, if things do change, then the TAs will hopefully grade them. If not, then I will sort of do a fairly light grading before the end of the quarter. But I apologize for that. That's certainly not something that we anticipated. Um, there is one last homework assignment, but it's not, it's sort of, as I said in the um, announcement, it's basically being sent out problem by problem <laughs> as I make the problems. Um, and so that's not due till next Friday. Um, you know, at, at sort of midnight, the usual time. So you have, you know, basically two weeks to do that, but obviously use your time wisely. Uh, just to give you the sense, um, they are all MATLAB problems where you write a little function um, and it's self-graded and you have as many attempts as you want to just keep submitting and until you get it right. So um, you should all do very well on that because you can just do it until you get it right. Um, and just so you know that the, um, what you should be looking for is I, I, each of the solutions I've done, even, even not trying to cram lines or anything, they're all less than 10 lines. So every solution I have that I've done for myself um, is 10 lines of code or less, okay? So we're not looking at big long programs. These should be fairly, just a few equations, maybe a few if and state, you know, if else statements to check for conditions, um, you're not, um, looking for any more than 10 lines. I, I, a few students have already completed it, so I know that they do work and, and they have been debugged somewhat, but if you have any issues, let me know. Um, so yeah, and I am thinking about, um, probably not this week because there are not many people, but given the situation, probably, you know, I'm thinking it might make sense to offer more office hours next week that I could offer on Zoom. Uh, I see some nods, so I'll send out a survey and Probably evenings are best, is that right? Like if I do the office hours in the evenings, otherwise it conflicts with classes. Okay, anyways, I'll send out a poll, but it's, I, I, I see some nods and no, no, no's or, but um, so that's good. Um, so anything else on class course logistics? So don't forget your project um, descriptions are due by this Wednesday. Uh, I tell you, I'll try to give feedback. The ones that have been sent in, I've already given a lot of feedback. I know there's a few outstanding, I'll give feedback on those. Um, if you look at the Google spreadsheet, um, green means you're good to go. Uh, if there's no color, it means I haven't gotten anything from you. And if it's orange, it means we've had some interactions, but I'm not really not clear. I never got a reply to my response. So I'm just sort of waiting to hear what your final project is. Okay. So if you are one of those orange ones, just send me a note saying, yeah, this is what we plan to do. Okay. Uh, and um, it should be fairly straightforward. Okay, are there any questions before we, yes? Are these slides posted? Uh, these slides, are these not posted? Yes, yeah. they are posted. In week nine? Yeah. Yeah, everyone sees them? Yeah, okay, good. All right, so we're all good? Okay, great. Okay, so today what we're gonna do is, uh, it's MR lecture six. Uh, we're going to do our, just, we're going to talk about slice selection and then relaxation, grading echoes and spin echoes, image contrast. So that'll get us through sort of the bare minimum of what 
you really need to know about MRI just in terms of how MRI works. Once we're done with that, we'll shift gears a little bit and talk a little more, sort of get you up to speed. This is everything you've learned up to now is what I would call classic MRI, classical MRI. Um, but we're now already in the postmodern phase. So, you know, we'll talk a little bit about what's modern MRI, what's postmodern MRI. This is sort of like circa, everything up we've done up to now is like circa 1980s, early 90s MRI, okay? Which was what people needed to get MRI off the ground to start doing clinical exams. Um, but since the 90s, and especially even more recently, there's been a lot of advances. So we'll want to touch upon those just so you have a sense moving forward uh, what's what's current. But the the basics are still good to know. So yes. Uh, I don't know if we have time, but go for the quiz. I... The pre lecture quiz. Yeah. We're going to do that right now. <laughs> At least in the last two minutes. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, so that's 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 good. So basically, let's go over the quiz. So yeah, so generally, there's generally one one quiz that, and I never know which one it's going to be. It differs from class to class. Where, so the performance on this quiz was the lowest it's been. It's like the average score was fifty eight percent, which I like to have them about seventy five percent, right? Mm -hmm. um, now, just to ease your mind, realize each problem is only worth like point one, at most point one points, right? Because all the quizzes together are three points at most, and then there's 30 and there's, they get, so so don't worry. I mean, these are meant to help you and it's meant to help me also see what's going on with the class. So definitely when I saw these results, I realized, oh yeah, we'll, we'll definitely spend some time going over that, okay? So we'll actually spend the next five or 10 minutes going over the quiz. Um, at least what sort of, what went wrong. I'm not necessarily gonna go over the, the answers, but I'm gonna go over the concepts that I think were, were missed, okay? Okay, so remember we have these design rules and here I'm summarizing it to show you basically there are really only six equations you need to know for classical MRI, okay? There's how to determine delta KY and delta KX, how to determine WKX, and I, I fortunately put the X and Y in different order, but that's okay. Uh, and then WKX and WKY. And so these are sort of, this covers aliasing, this covers resolution, and then this is um, basically where you are in case space and how it's related to the gradients, okay? So everything we talk about up to now is covered by these six equations. And you can see they're fairly simple equations, but even with those equations, you can have a lot of complexity. So we talked about this a little before. What we mostly focused on is going through Cartesian, okay? So going line by line by line along a Cartesian case space. And in a, in a spin warp, the initial dephaser took us from the center of K space out to each starting point. And then this was the readout direction, okay? And so for the spin warp, we went through some, some design of each of the gradients, okay? And that applies to the spin warp pulse sequence. And so we essentially applying these principles to the spin warp pulse sequence. Now, those are not the, the equations that you would use for any of these other sequences, okay? All these other, sequences, you would apply the same principles, but the exact equations you come up with will be slightly different. So for example, on one of your homework problems in the MATLAB problem, you're asked to design like this trajectory, okay? It's actually pretty simple. It's less than 10 lines of code, okay? Could be doing five if you wanted to, um, but you cannot apply the spin warp equations directly to this. So don't make that mistake. The good thing is it's a self-graded thing. So if you do that, you'll, you'll just say it's wrong, wrong, wrong. And so at least you get the feedback and you know not to do it, okay? So that's, I just wanna give that general overview because one, one common mistake that people first starting MRI do is they go, oh, okay, I know these equations and it's what we all do in school, right? We see the equations and we just try to copy them onto the next problem, right? But part of engineering in graduate school is telling you that's not the way to go. When you're teaching you the principles, you need to take the principles and apply them to new situations. Okay. Um, so that's my philosophical spiel. Okay. Uh, so now we'll get into the actual hardcore um, questions. So the first question um, was, if you want to increase spatial resolution MRI, what should you do? Okay. And so one thing is this is increased spatial resolution.
Does everyone agree with that? Like when you go and buy a new iPhone or whatever TV, when it says better resolution, you expect things to be better, right? But that means Delta X and Delta Y are going down. Right. So that I think that was one sort of uh, thing that was a little confusing. And sometimes when we say increased resolution, people say, oh, that means we're increasing um, delta x, delta y. No, higher resolution, increased resolution means the vic your voxel size, your pixel size is getting smaller, right? Okay. If you went and bought a TV that said higher resolution and it had bigger voxels, you'd be not very happy, right? Okay. So what that means is, and then the picture of it is, if I want better resolution in one domain, I'm getting more information here, I better be acquiring more information in the other domain as well, right? So the smaller my pixel size is getting, it means I have to go farther out in case space to, to get enough information to, to sort of make that nice image, all right? So in that case, obviously, when we, when we increase resolution, we also need to increase the maximum spatial frequency acquired, right? Okay, so I think as long as you didn't get confused on what increase or decrease is, then that, that's a fairly straightforward non-mathematical question. Okay. <clears throat> I think most people, 75% did pretty well on the next one, which is basically, yeah, to avoid aliasing, right? We just want this to be the case, right? So we're always, if you have aliasing, then you need to make these guys smaller, right? And remember, once again, the smaller you are in one domain, if you sample finally in one domain, you're gonna replicate in the other domain. So if you sample too coarsely, then the replicas start smashing together and you have aliasing. Okay? So that's a non-mathematical question. Um, so at least 75% of you guys got that right. Okay, now let's look at sort of the one where uh, problem three, which 56% got right. Um, so we need to talk about this. Okay. So this one was, um, let's look at this slide here. So we have a spin warp pulse sequence, right? And we're talking about just the readout direction, right? So remember, this is the readout gradient, okay? And it has some amplitude GXR. And we know that uh, it says, let's say we decrease the FOV by a factor of two, right? That's in your problem. But we keep the number of readout samples the same. Okay. And also the delta T is the same. All right. So there's a number of ways of doing this. There's one that is just sort of thinking about it and saying, well, that's, that's probably right. I'm just take a guess on that. So if I keep, if I have my, this is my image, right? And let's say I have a hundred voxels across my image, right? I have some resolution. Now I say I decrease the FOV by two, but I have the same number of samples. So what has, um, is my spatial resolution gone, gone up or down? It's gone up, right? My each voxel is smaller, right? So um, I have doubled my resolution. I've, I've decreased my delta x by two, right? Because my resolution size has gone down by two, right? So therefore, I must have gone twice as far out in case space to gather that information. Okay. So in this case, in this case, you could say, well, it must mean that I have to double the highest spatial frequency I acquired by that factor of two. All right. So that's one way you could do that, just by thinking about, well, you know, not, you know, just sort of thinking about things just in terms of what information you need. All right. The other way you can do it is this. Um, if I, if my FOV is here, if I decrease my FOV by a factor of two, that means that delta K has to go up by a factor of two, right? Just by my design equation, if I'm going to satisfy my design equation, right? And then, but delta T is the same, right? And N read is the same. So I have N of these points, right? And each of them spans, I'm going delta K, I've doubled the step, delta Kx, the step size, right? But I have the same number of readout points. So therefore, since I've doubled the step size in K space, I'm going, I can go up twice as far in K space, right? So that's the other way you could look at that. 
All right. So are there any questions on that problem there? So there's usually more than one way to think about these problems. And, and that's, and even in the real world, when you ever, you do any research, you all, the, as I always tell all my students, there's no answer in the back of the book in the real world, right? So how do we do research? We usually do it by trying to ask the same question from different directions, right? And if you get the same answer, no matter how you ask it, then generally you have higher confidence that your answer is correct, right? Um, or else you build it and it fails and then, you know, the answer's wrong. So then you go back and fix it, okay? Okay, um, so everyone okay with that? The last problem also, I think, um, yeah, this one only 51% got, so that's not good. Um, so let's, we definitely have to talk about that. Um, let me get some space here. Let's see what I draw this. I'll draw it on this one now. Um, so here you're told that the divide resolutions in the X and Y directions are one millimeter and two, mil two millimeters, right? And you said your G max was equal to five gauss per centimeter, right? And you're designing a spin or pulse sequence. And the minimum time in microseconds required for the initial readout dephaser. So remember, readout is the GX gradient, right? And this is the dephaser. So this is the readout dephaser. Right? And you're told you want to, you want this has to basically uh, you want to have a resolution of one millimeter resolution delta X. So first of all, if I have, I have X resolution of one and Y resolution of two, do I have to go out farther in K space in KX or farther in K space in KY? Which is gonna determine how far, which is the, for, so I have X resolution is one millimeter, right? Y resolution is two millimeters. Do I have to go farther out in KX or KY to meet those constraints? KX, KX right? Because remember, WKX, W just equals one over delta, right? How far I go in K space. So since one is smaller than two, then one over one is bigger, right? It's twice as big. So, so now if I have two gradients, GX and GY gradients, which area has to be bigger? The GX gradient and the GY gradient to go out to that place in K space. The GX gradient, right? Because I have to go farther out, right? So we know, even if, even if I didn't tell you as the react dephaser, I said, so well, just define the dephasers to be minimum time. You know that the GX gradient is going to be the limiting factor, right? Because that's the biggest area you need, right? So then you would just say, well, I know my area that I need, right, is equal to one over 0.1 inverse centimeters. Well, one over centimeters, right? So that's uh, 10 inverse centimeters, is that right? Okay. And then I know that's equal to, and they said I could say I could use 4,000, right? And I, the max gradient I have is five, right? So I might as well use the maximum gradient. And then I solve for this delta T. Okay. Um, now does this give me the right answer or not? Let's see. One over, well, let's go ahead and solve it. One over two. Now that's not going to give me the right answer. What did I screw up? Can anyone see what I did wrong? I thought I checked this. Hmm. Oh, okay. Um, right, because I don't want to go out to WKX. I want to go to KX max, right? So this is for, this is the area for W, right? But for the dephaser, I only want to go out half of that, right? Everyone got that? Okay, right? So this, this is WKX, right? And this is minus KX max. Okay. So uh, the area is gonna be half of this. All right? So that would be five inverse centimeters. And so have something that's basically, I'm gonna get something that's one over 4,000. So that gives me the answer that I want. Okay. 
The dephaser is just, this is the dephaser. So it's like that initial shift in X before you're speaking across the X. Yeah, the dephaser is what you takes you out there at that point. Yeah. So the minimum time required, yeah. Yeah, and, and actually the problem says the gradient pulse that takes you out to minus K max. So it does actually tell you where you're going. So I think the thing here is just to realize that um, even though, um, you know, when you're taking a course, it seems like a lot of the things, like there's just all these little details that you have to worry about, like, oh, factor of two, or why do I have to do that? But then when you go in the real world, it actually turns out that matters, right? If you're off by a factor of two in the real world, that's the difference between like the space shuttle blowing up or not, right? So it does matter. So that's why we give you these problems. And here the consequence is 0 0.1 points, right? In the real world, you know, it's got much bigger consequences. So um, one of my professors in grad school, he had a line, that obviously I still remember, he says, basically, um, and it's a line from some, British guy from the 1800s, but he was like this guy, he was well known for, like he did the most complicated linear algebra, like just like textbooks of you know linear algebra. But he would always start off with a two by two matrix and see if it works for a two by two matrix. And then you go to a three by three matrix and see if it works for a three by three matrix. And then from there, he's like, okay, if it works that, probably I can generalize this to like N dimensions, right? So he always just say, take care of, the pennies and the dollars will take care of themselves. <laughs> okay, so take care of the details. And usually if you get the details right, the problem, the bigger problems sometimes just take care of themselves. Okay, so it does, it is important to take um, care of the details. Yes. Um, Oh, you mean half of WKX? Well, I guess because you're told it's a spin or pull sequence, spin or pull sequence always goes out to um, that, you know, you basically, you know, you have to go to the max resolution, you have to go out to this point, right? So, you know, that's half of your window. I mean, it doesn't have to be, but just from what we've talked about in spin warp, we're always going out to that point and then zooming out. Okay. Right. So, was there a question? <laughs> uh, the next quiz will be easier, yes. But then I'll probably make another quiz that will ask the same questions as this quiz for the following quiz, just to make sure people get it. Okay. So, that should also be easier, right? By definition. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, okay. So, um, yeah. Um, so the other thing I want to talk about, some questions came up at the end of last class, which I think um, if you're looking at the phasing code gradient, that's this gradient that's changing in amplitude. Okay. So I made up this new slide, which shows that what I'm drawing here is basically, th this is what we play out in time over each repetition. And here I'm just sort of superimposing them on top of each other. Okay. And the other thing that came up was this GYI is simply this increment between the gradient amplitudes between each of these successive ones. Before it looked like it was always gonna be half of the GYP, but it's not, it's just, in, in general, it's a very small fraction. Like if I have 128 above and 120 below, then that GYI is like this, each little increment, okay? Okay, so um, any questions on that? Okay. Any questions online? Okay, so the, what I wanna talk about next is uh, a few things that um, are just good to know in general. Um, one is called Gibbs artifact. And what this means is, remember uh, when we window in one domain, that means we're convolving with a sync function in another domain. So if in my object, I have a very sharp, op, sharp transition, like between muscle and bone or you know water and skull, then that, this edge here represents a sharp transition in my image. And if I window, I would be convolving that with a sync function. And what that will give me are these ripples here. Okay. And what it looks like an image is, for example, here, there's obviously a very sharp boundary here 
between this, uh, you know, probably thing of water and the out air. And so there's gonna be these ripples in my image. So diagnostically, these can be very, um, a bit sort of distracting, especially if you're looking at say cartilage or something and, or, or something and you, and you see these ripples, you wanna make sure that you're trying to ask yourself, is that in the object or is that actually in the physiology, right? So one way you can get around it is you can just increase your window size and that makes your sink function get narrower. And so there's still ripples there, but at least they die away more quickly. Okay. So here, that's what exactly what's happened. There's ripples here, but you just can't see them because they're, they die away faster. So one option is to go out farther in case space, but that means it's going to take more time. Mm -hmm. right. The other option in this is, um, is to, instead of using a rect function, why not use something that some of you have a lot of familiarity with now from your projects, something like the handing window. Okay, so roll off those high frequencies instead of a sharp cutoff. So what that means is instead of the sync function, I'm convolving with something that's a lot smoother. Okay, so now that edge, when I convolve it with that, instead of these ripples, I get this black sort of transition. Okay. Uh, now there's no free lunch, so what did I give up? I got rid of the ripples, but what did I give up? Sorry? It's less sharp, right? It's a smoother transition. There's gonna be some blurriness, right? Yeah. So if that's not okay, then you've got to go collect more data. Right. Uh, another thing that um, I'm just gonna tell you, you don't, don't worry about all the math and stuff, but just typically, um, especially in the old days, and even now when you look at, you know, how many samples you acquire in case space, it's always typically an even number. You know, you'll talk about like a 64 by 64 matrix or 256 by 256. Um, in the old days, that mattered because, um, you know, we had to use FFTs or fast forward transforms and they only, only really worked well for powers of two. Okay, now computers are much faster. You've got GPUs. It's not a much of an issue, but certainly 20 or 30 years ago, you know, you had, if you wanted your image to come up in real time, you had to use a fast FFT, okay? And so the question is, um, you know, if I, let's say, and it's, I collect four lines in case space, so I can collect the middle line, right? And I can collect two lines above and one line above, but then if I want to collect this bottom line, then I have to collect five lines, right? And then my FFT, I, there's no FFT, at least back then, there was no FFT formula for five. Okay, now there's like FFTW and new techniques. But so one thing is, well, what, what happens if I don't collect this line? And it turns out that this line is actually redundant. Okay, that the, that the, the, the information it represents is actually represented also by this line here. Okay, based once you've chosen your sampling. Okay. And it comes down to the fact that e to the minus i pi when it goes to a certain number is always minus one whether you go this way or that way, okay? So this is like going 180 degrees, it's like going minus 180 degrees. So it just turns out that mathematically, it's the same thing, okay? Uh, and this will go through it, but we'll, let, let's skip this slide for now. The last thing I wanna talk about is actually a um, very practical question is if I have a long object, okay? So far we've talked about, there's a readout direction and a phase encode direction. And in spin warp, the readout, we're going fast and the phase encode is sort of step by step by step. So it turns out that if you have a long object, you should always put the, long, the longer dimension along the readout direction. Okay, and we wanna talk about why, okay? Because let's say you put the long direction across, let's say I have, this is, let's say I did X and Y, and this is my object, right? So now the field of view of Y is really big, okay? And that means Delta KY is gonna be small, right? I have to take little tiny steps in K space. So to get out to any, you know, let's say I want some resolution to get out to that KX max, and take me a lot of steps. It's going to take me a lot of time. 
Okay. So it turns out we don't ever want to do that. Okay. It turns out that if you're given the object, you always want to put the um, readout direction along the x coordinate. Okay. Now that doesn't mean like the magnet has a physical x y z coordinate, but that doesn't matter. You can always put the readout gradient along any physical dimension. So the the the, the uh, the software will take care of that for you. It's just you being smart enough to say, okay, I want to put it on the readout direction. And why is that? Well, it turns out that this is really useful because um, in certain cases, let's say you're imaging someone's spine, right? You might only care about um, the central portion of the spine. Okay, so like if this was a person here, right? Not a very good person. And this is its spine, right? You want to only image, let's say you only want to image part of that person. Okay. And you want to do sort of what's called a sagittal view. You want to look at them halfway. So you always want to put this in the X direction and this in the Y direction. Because it turns out that, as we'll show in a minute, we can basically eliminate the contributions from those spins that are outside. Okay. So we can actually, if we put things in the readout direction, we can actually make the field of view smaller. And how do we do that? Well, remember when we have the readout gradient on, there's a gradient, right? And so let's say this is the part we really care about imaging. And this is the isocenter. So the spins here are uh, at omega naught. Okay. The spins here will be at omega naught plus delta omega, let's say. And let's say the spins here are omega naught minus delta omega. So a little less frequency, okay? So there's some frequency range spanned by this, right? And so they're in the some frequency range. Now let's say here, let's say the stomach, that's gonna be at say omega naught minus some other, let's say omega L, okay? So it's gonna be outside some, it's gonna be at a, some lower frequency. So the signal, remember the MR signal is essentially just this signal that's coming in, right, over time. So we should be able, and that has some frequencies to it, right? And those frequencies are determined by these frequencies. So it's saying there's some component of my signal that has this frequency, some that has this frequency, some that has this frequency, and some that has this frequency. So what I'd like to do is I just like to say, I only want to keep part of my signal within some frequency band. Okay? And everything else I will filter out. And so what we do is we use what's called a low pass filter, okay? Uh, in the old days, it was probably analog. These days, it's all digital. Okay, so we'll just use a digital filter to just get rid of that. So, so that's really cool. That means that we can essentially say, just give me this part of the field of view and everything else I can get rid of. So I don't have to sample as much, right? My field of view can be a reasonable number. Uh, so this is just what it looks like here. So remember we showed you before, we have an R signal, we have these mixers, and then these are the low pass filters, okay? So in fact, it turns out if this is the actual field of view, if my low pass filter has a smaller bandwidth, then it gives me this smaller, my output would have that smaller bandwidth, okay? So that means that there should never be aliasing in the readout direction. Now, the, tr the, the fact of the matter, that filter is never perfect, right? There's gonna be some roll off. So you can't really get right up to that. So that's, you in practice, you have to make it a little bigger than what you want, but at least you're not having to make it really big. Uh, so one se sequence that this comes, like this is a MP range is, is a sequence that's used all the time to get really nice images, typically of the head. And this comes up all the time. So this is, anytime this is done, this is always the readout direction, okay? And the reason for that is you have someone's head on their body and their legs and stuff and their arms. You basically put this in the readout direction so you can basically just keep this part and filter out all this part, okay? And so that's uh, a very, um, something that um, is done um, all the time. So that's just something just for your knowledge in terms of you know, how uh, some of the, one of the details of MRI. But it also gives us a nice segue into the next topic, which we're gonna get into, which is slice selection. So slice selection is another bread and butter technique. Um, we, we mentioned a little bit, it's essentially 
in CT, obviously it makes sense. You can go slice by slice by slice or with a spiral, you know, you can reconstruct the data later. In MR, there's two main ways of collecting data. There's 2D and 3D, okay? 3D means you do a 3D Fourier transform. Okay? You, you collect data in 3D K space. And so it generally takes longer because you've got to acquire both KX, KY, and KZ. And that's gonna take time. So for a lot of things, especially where you don't have time and you wanna go really fast, you want to do slice by slice by slice by slice by slice by slice. Okay. And then you encode each slice. And so it's basically you're doing dealing with a lot of little 2D problems. Now it turns out between those two, between 2D and 3D, there's also like two and a half D. There's there's techniques that sort of merge the two. Okay. So there's lots of tricks um, that people have come up with over the years. Um, which actually the the sort of the two and a half D is something called simultaneous multi-slice, which basically excites like five slices at a time and just sort of goes through like that, okay? Um, so um, yeah, I should have put that on the uh, project. That's, that'd be a very cool project. Simu if someone's looking for a project, simultaneous multi-slice is a really cool project. Um, so let's review what we mean by our, our excitation. Um, remember, um, the equilibrium magnetization is always aligned with the D, not main field. And then we excite the spins so that they come away from their equilibrium magnetization and then they process around so we can have a nice signal that we can pick up with a coil over here. But so far, what we've talked about is exciting all the spins. So if I put a body in there, I apply this pulse, all the spins get excited. So I have a 3D volume of spins and that's what I'd be imaging. So what we want to do is say, I don't want to excite all the spins. I want to leave most of the spins alone. I just want to excite spins in a certain slice. Okay. And so that's shown here. Uh, and that's what's called selective excitation. So non-selective is what we talked about before, that non-selective is all the spins are tipped or, or excited. And in selective, you can sort of see only these spins have been flipped over. If we look at the M sub Z before excitation, M sub Z is, let's say M sub naught everywhere. After excitation, only the spins within some Delta Z go to zero, that M sub Z component goes to zero. And if we look at the transverse component, that transverse component goes to M sub one, M sub naught, sorry. Okay. So basically I'm zeroing out my longitudinal magnetization and I'm maxing out my transverse magnetization using this selective excitation. And so the key is that, let's say we want to slice here, right? We want to turn on what's called the slice select gradient. Okay, and by definition, this is always going to be along the Z direction, okay, just by convention. So that means if I have a gradient, then spins will process at different frequencies, right? So I want a pulse that's only going to excite spins with a certain frequency, right? Okay. This is another look at it. If I have a gradient in the Z direction, then remember once again, I have something processing. In this case, we'll use F naught. This is at F naught plus, uh, let's call this Delta F over two. And this would be at F naught minus Delta F over two. So that, let's say that these, were, these are my slice, the boundary of my slice, right? That means that to tip these spins over here, I have to give my, my signal have to have some component at F naught. And to tip these spins here, that has to have some component F naught plus delta F over two. And similar for here, I have to have some component of my spin, my signal at F naught minus delta F over two. So that means that if I look at the bandwidth of my signal that I need, it's got some bandwidth here, okay? And that bandwidth is given exactly by this formula, like gamma over two pi, gz, delta z. This represents the, the delta f that I span with this gradient, okay? That gradient creates a delta change in frequency of that amount, where it depends on both g sub z and delta z. So great, I know I want some electronic, let some radio frequency signal 
that has this bandwidth. Okay. So that means in the Fourier domain, it's going to be a sync pulse. Okay. So it's actually going to be, and, and just so the sync pulse is actually the envelope of my function. So I've actually looked at the, let's say I drew my sync pulse, right, like that then actually what's played out is a very high frequency thing that's modulated by that sync pulse. Okay, so the sync is the envelope. And then this, the thing here is at omega naught, at say at f naught, which is oftentimes called the carrier frequency. Okay, so those of you who've done electrical engineering, that's sort of the carrier frequency and then the, the sink is my envelope, okay? Uh, question. Can you say it again? Uh, sorry. Blue line. Uh, yes, sorry, what? what? Oh, what is this blue line? Oh, this represents uh, the gradient strength. So this is just saying that the field is, so this is a function of Z. So this is, and this width here is Delta Z. And then this is just showing, if I have a gradient field that's increasing the gradient strength, the, the B field here, then uh, this would be at, let's say, let's say this is at B naught, right? So here at isocenter, I'm gonna be at B naught, right? So my frequency is just gamma over two pi B naught, okay, F naught is that, okay? Here I am at, at this point I'm at B equals B naught plus GZ delta Z over two, okay? So my frequency is going to be F naught plus gamma over two pi gz delta z over two. What is the x-axis? Um, this is just showing the frequency. Okay, so it's basically showing that if I'm a spin here, I'm at some frequency, right? And if I'm a spin here, I'm at some frequency. And if I'm a spin here, I'm at another frequency. Um, so similarly, this one here, this is going to be at B equals B naught minus GZ delta Z over two, right? And so this has a frequency F, so this should be an F here, F equals F naught minus um, gamma over two pi GZ delta Z over two. Let's call this the low frequency. Let's call this the high frequency, right? So if I take FH minus FL, that is just gonna be gamma over two pi GZ delta Z. So that's the difference in the frequency between those spins at those two points. And this is basically my delta F, okay. which I'll, we can also call that the bandwidth. So that's the desired bandwidth of my signal. All right. Okay, so with that, let's do a slice selection problem. And this problem is essentially, the next few things we go over is essentially for your MATLAB problem on this, you essentially wanna just use these sort of equations and just, you're just getting practice using these equations. Um, and in fact, the, 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 the last problem I, I just made up yesterday actually has a pretest version. So basically the first pretest is you get, the answers you get should be exactly the answers we get here. Okay, and so you can do that as many times as you want until you get these answers. And then because, and when those are all correct, then you should high confidence and if you hit submit, then all the other conditions will also be met. Okay. Okay, so here's the problem. I want a slice profile that has a rect of Z over 10 millimeters. So this is basically one centimeter slice thickness, right? Delta Z equals one centimeter. Okay. I have a sync pulse that has T of 400 microseconds. So there's really 
one question I want to ask is, there's two questions. One is, what is the amplitude of the slice set gradient, sort of the GZ gradient to use? Okay. And then what is the amplitude of the RF pulse needed to achieve a 90 degree flip angle? So we're going to go through that, but also for your for the MATLAB problem, essentially, this is, these are the kind of things that we want to just calculate. And once again, those are just going to be one or two lines of code for these calculations, and then maybe a few other lines of code for some error checking and things like that. Okay. So let's look at the first column first. So if I have a sync pulse, right, and it has the uh, first zero at t. Okay, and it has amplitude A. What is the area of that sync pulse again? It's just A times C, right? Okay. So we know that then from going back to the RF stuff, we know that the theta is just equal to gamma times the integral of B1 of T. Okay. Which is basically my area, right? So I know that I want A times T times gamma equals theta, which is in this case, pi over two. Okay. So to solve for the amplitude, I would just say A equals pi over two over T times gamma. All right, so that's, we'll see that calculation in a minute. Now, the next thing we need to do is figure out, um, whoops, what happened here? What's this GZ amplitude I want? Well, remember my bandwidth delta F is going to be gamma over two pi GZ delta Z. Okay. So the next question is, what's the bandwidth of a sync pulse like this? Okay. Well, let's take the Fourier transform. It's going to be the Fourier transform of sync of T over T is equal to T times rect TF, right? And what's the width of this, what's the width of this function? One over T, right? Or the bandwidth is one over T. So the width of that, the, the spectrum of that rect rec function is one over T. So I can just say that this equals one over T. And then I can just solve for GZ, GZ, equals one over gamma over two pi times delta Z times T. All right. So that's exactly what is shown here. Okay. So that's exactly the formula that's shown here. Okay. And it's, this is also showing that that's bandwidth. All right. And this is showing that, um, that this rect of F over bandwidth turns out to have sync of bandwidth times T times sync of T over tau. And this is just reminding you of the Fourier transform of the sync function. All right. And so in that case, if we get G sub Z, so when you do your MATLAB, you know that this is one of the answers you should get when you put in these parameters, okay? The other one answer you should get is this one, okay? Using the formula we just derived, all right? Any questions before we move on? So why don't we actually do um, a couple problems in class just to make sure uh, you get this. Um, and uh, there will be a problem like this on the next pre-lecture quiz, but hopefully if we do these problems, this will, this will be more people will get it, okay? Okay, so you have designed an RF sync pulse excited slice that is two millimeters thick with a slice like gradient of two scouts per centimeter. The user decides to double the slice thickness to four millimeters. If the parameters of the R pulse are called, kept constant, so that's like the, a, the amplitude and the T, what should the amplitude of the slice like gradient be changed to? So this comes up all the time on the scanner, right? Someone just changes the slice thickness, so you're trying to figure out what's going on behind the scenes. Okay. And it's also a good sanity check when you do your problem um, if you like double um, the slice thickness, you should see what happens to your gradient. Okay. Yeah. So go ahead and online, there's a poll in class. We'll do a, an audio poll real quickly. 
Uh, so take a minute or two and feel free to discuss this. Um, Okay, let's uh, see what people are thinking in class. So um, at the count of three, just uh, yell out what you think is the closest answer. So one, two, three. Okay, so it sounds like A. Uh, online, it's about equally split between C and E. Um, so let's see which is the best answer, okay? So the R pulse is kept the same, right? So that means that this T has not changed, right? So remember T, the bandwidth is just one over T, right? So it means the bandwidth has not changed either, right? And we know the bandwidth is just gonna be gamma over two pi times GZ times delta Z, right? So delta Z, we went up by a factor of two, is that right? <laughs> so what do we need for GZ to do to keep the bandwidth the same? Yeah, half it, right? So that would give me A. Everyone okay with that problem? All right, I think this is slightly harder, but good to do. Uh, now you design an RF pulse with the first zero at T to excite a slice that is two millimeters thick, with the slice gradient of two gauss per centimeter. The user decides to double this thickness to four. Now you're keeping G sub Z the same. Okay, now what do you need to change with the R sync pulse? And so here you can see you have to both change the width and maybe do something to the amplitude or maybe not change anything. Okay. So let's go ahead and do that. I'm gonna relaunch the poll.
Okay, about another minute. Okay, let's um, pull in class. So at the count of three, just say what you think is the best or closest answer. One, two, three. Okay, it's either B or D. Okay, so it's either contract or dilate. So that's good. Okay, so that is the question, right? Is it no change or is it dilate or contract first? And then once we know whether it's dilate or contract, <laughs> then we have to decide whether we're gonna double the amplitude or half the amplitude. So let's look at the first, whether we need to make this call wider or narrower. All right. So remember, let's always go back to bandwidth equals gamma over two pi GZ times delta Z. Okay. So what did we do with delta Z? We doubled it, right? And G sub Z, we said we we're gonna keep it the same, right? Why would we have to keep G sub Z the same? Well, maybe we maxed out on the gradient. Maybe we can't go more than, you know, two gal per centimeter. Sometimes this, every system has a maximum gradient. So maybe we just can't do it, okay? So this means that bandwidth has to go on a by factor of two, right? But T equals one over the bandwidth. So that must have gone down by a factor of two, right? So we're gonna be contracting, right? So what's the other thing we need to keep in mind? We know that theta equals gamma times A times t. And although I don't think it said this ex explicitly, you know, we probably want to keep the flip angle the same. Okay, that's sort of implied here. So gamma is just a constant. Uh, t we've made go down by a factor of two, right? So what do we need to do to a to keep the flip angle the same? Obviously it has to go up by a factor of two, right? So in that case, b would be the right answer. So you can sort of see there, there's not that many equations, but there's, you know, it once you, and so as you're writing your MALAP code, just realize that that problem is only using these types of equations. Okay. Yes, question. Um, you mean in this problem? Yeah, I mean, uh, to be a better question, it's just, you should say theta is constant. Okay. Okay, any questions on that? All right. Um, I think that's all the math we're gonna do for today. Now we're just gonna tell you things. <laughs> okay. Um, and get ready for next time. So uh, let me just explain uh, how what we just did sets into the context of actual MRI. So typically when you look at the envelope, you will see sync pulses all over the place in MRI, okay? Now, in our class, in our example, and in your Palmer problem, you can assume an ideal sink that goes from minus infinity to infinity, right? In real world, obviously, we have to do a truncated sink. Okay, so you typically see some sort of truncated sink. It's so typically going to be a sink function multiplied by like a Hamming window or a Hamming window or some function that smooths it down. Okay, this is a slice like gradient that we just also talked about. And what we didn't talk about is slice refocusing gradient. It turns out that. If you just play this out, you don't, nothing turns out and you actually need to refocus the spins to get everything to line up before you can work with it. Right. And then this, these are the gradients that we talked about for the spin work full sequence. So all these things together are essentially, that's the basic thing you need for an MRI full sequence. Okay. And this exact, essentially, you know, an implementation of this, it's what's happening um, in let's say 80% of the full sequences currently being run like right now okay it's basically doing this okay um and so then for the readout gradient if my object was a rec function then um i would end up with what's called a gradient echo which is essentially that's just defined as when i cross kx equals zero all the spins are in phase at that point at least along the uh x direction and that's what we define as gradient echo, okay? which we'll come back to later. Now, I'm just gonna show you some things just to sort of point out how complicated this can get and, and sort of also how interesting this can get. 
It turns out that we've described a pattern, which is essentially, I want to implement a rect function, right? Essentially say, if, if my slice profile is a rect function, these are the design rules we use. It turns out you can give me any function in the world and I can figure out what RF Gaussian gradient to play out. And that is this theory that was developed by John Pauley uh, when he was a graduate student at Stanford, you know, back, I don't know how many, that's like 40 years ago or 30 years ago, 30 plus years ago. So basically he basically came up with this beautiful formulation as a graduate student, this was his PhD thesis. And this is now what people use, okay? And the idea is that we, everything I just told you, we can look at in the Fourier domain and look at, it turns out that we can look at the RF pulse. This is before the days of 3D printing. The, the idea is the same, that the RF pulse at each point in time, we can, we can think of it as putting a layer of magnetization down. And then each layer of magnetization that's put down, we can build that up to create any image we want or any profile we want. So for example, if I want just a sphere, if I just want to like excite just like a circle of magnetization, I could play out some RF pulse and some gradients in the GX and GY. And then when I look at my image, it will just be exciting magnetization within some sphere or some circle. And the way these would satisfy essentially the Fourier transform of a circle, which turns out to be a Bessel function. You can go even more um, crazy. In this case, uh, the investigator here took a picture. I believe this is his wife, okay? And so he took the Fourier transform of this picture, used those Fourier transform coefficients to code up the scanner. And then this is essentially imprinting a pattern of his wife's picture into the spins and then taking, taking an MR image of those spins. And so this is what he got. So, I mean, this is pretty cool, right? I mean, obviously um, not clinically useful, but a, a, nice, a nice trick to show that you can actually, whatever pattern you want, you could in principle um, imprint it into the space. Okay. So uh, one practical application that some of you may or may not look at is cardiac tagging. So in this case, it's a much more simple thing. If I wanna just implement a bunch of stripes onto my object, right? Well, you can imagine to first order, that's just like, I wanna implement a cosine function onto my spins, right? And what's the Fourier transform of a cosine function? Two Dirac delta functions. So looks, so actually, if you actually look at just playing out a pulse, that's just one pulse for the gradient and another pulse, look at the outcome, that will turn out to be something that you can do to do the, the sort of spin tagging, some, some version of that. And for cardiac imaging, the reason this is useful is because now you can do this in 1D. This is just the 1D grid. Obviously, you can do a 2D grid. And now you, this is actually in the spins, right? This is a pattern that's actually, you're imprinting that pattern into the spins. So now as the heart moves, that pattern will move, right, and deform. And if you're a bioengineer or a mechanical engineer, now you can start calculating like strain, right? And, and, and using that to characterize the mechanical properties of your uh, object. So that is one fairly practical application of, of taking advantage of this flexibility in RF pulses. Okay. So for this year, we're not really going into much more detail on RF pulses. It's really just that slice selection. Um, and so before we move on, are there any questions? Okay. So now we're going to switch gears a little bit. We're going to leave case space behind for a while and go back to relaxation. Because okay, the last sort of thing we need to cover with cloud MRI is really image contrast. Like we've talked, you know, how do you um, set up your parameters such that you can get different contrasts? And, and, and we're going to go over some basic contrast. So just to remind you, the two main things we're going to focus on really are T1 and T2. T1 is the rate at which longitudinal magnetization recovers. And T2 is the rate at which transverse magnetization decays. Okay, so you have a recovery of the M sub Z component and you have a dying away of the M X Y component. Okay, so that's shown here where basically we have this M X Y sort of decaying away at the same time the M sub Z is growing back. 
we talked a little bit about how, why that's useful is because different tissues have different T1 values. And here you see they're a function of magnetic field strength. Typically you will see T1 increase as magnetic field strength gets bigger. Okay, so the first thing we want to talk about is um, what causes T1 relaxation, okay? Um, and one of the things that here what we have is a, a picture of T1 relaxation time versus molecular tumbling rates, okay? And then this is showing that um, when molecular tumbling is slow, then T1 is pretty long. And when it's fast, it's also um, pretty long. And then here at this frequency here, T1 is very short. So what is this? Imagine the spins are, um, you know, they, they basically are processing around, right? They have some sort of uh, frequency of precession, right? So they have energy. Uh, you can consider that sort of like some energy at some frequency at the Larmor frequency, right? And then they're in some room, right? They're in some structure like um, in tissue. And the question is how easily can they give that, that energy back up to their environment, okay? And it turns out energy transfer is always easiest at the resonant frequency, right? Um, if I'm vibrating like this and I have something that can also vibrate at that frequency, then it's easy for this energy to go into that thing, okay? If I'm vibrating like this and something is vibrating slower, then it's, there's not much energy transfer that's gonna go on. So there is this sort of sweet spot where um, basically um, <clears throat> if, I, if, if, the, um, if I'm at a, the right frequency um, and then every sort of uh, tissue sort of has its own sort of tumbling rate frequency, um, then that's that's a sweet spot. So that's shown here where example, uh, it's what's in this MRI questions website, they call it the Goldilocks principle, right? You're either uh, too slow, too fast, or just right, okay? And when your tumbling rate is just right, and so in this case, bound water typically has the right tumbling rate. Free water is tumbling too fast, uh, ice water is tumbling or macromolecules like fat are tumbling too slowly, right? They're really bound. They can't really move that fast. So it's really an interaction between what frequency the spins are at and what frequency the molecules are at. And so there's the most efficient T1 relaxation near F0 or the longer frequency. Uh, for example, let's say, you know, I think everyone has probably played on one of these things at the playground, right? It's like one of these turning things, right? And let's say there's people already on that, right? So if you're gonna jump on one of these things, you have gotta be at the right rate, right? To transfer, to get onto that. If you're going too slow or too fast, you're just not gonna be able to get onto the, um, that turning thing. And so the same thing with T1 relaxation. The T1 relaxation is most effective uh, if your lawnmower frequency matches the tumbling rate of your environment. Okay, so why, so what does that mean? Well. Imagine you're here at some lawnmower frequency and you're within sort of the tumbling rate and, and a lot of tissue is mostly water, right? So really water is the dominant tumbling rate that you care about. So if you're within that re regime, then yeah, there's gonna be pretty good transfer of energy. Okay. But now as people go to higher and higher field strengths, we're starting to move out of that tumbling rate region, right? And there's less of this water, there's more, there's some free water, but there's not much free water in the body, right? It's typically bound to something. So that means that there's gonna be less probability of an interaction that can give the energy back to the environment. And so that's why you see this increase in T1 um, as the field strength increases, all right? Um, one thing that's um, very characteristic as, as we talked about, Fast and oils typically have a very slow tumbling rate. So typically T1 is quite short in fat. So I think if you go back and look at this one, so see fat has the lowest T1s, right? Okay. At least in this plot. Um, so that's sort of a brief overview of T1. Now let's talk a little bit about T2. Are there any questions about T1 first before we move on? 
Yeah, I don't see anything online. So let's go over T2. T2 also has a range, but you can sort of see here, there's this sort of outlier here. CSF stands for cerebral spinal fluid, which is very fairly close to just free water. Okay. It's got other nutritional stuff in it, but it's it's very close to water, much more water-like than any of these other things. And so you can sort of see that anything that's liquid tends to have a very long T2. And especially things that are um, less mobile will have shorter T2s. So let's talk about what causes T2 relaxation. So T2 relaxation is caused by, if, if I start off at time equal zero and the spins are all aligned, T2 is about how quickly these spins become out of phase. Okay, Because if they become out of phase, then their vector sum is going to go to zero. So T1 had this curve here, right, as a function of tumbling rate. T2 actually has a very different dependence, okay? When things are slow, the T2 relaxation time, T2 is very short. So for things like solids, T2 is very short. And when T, when tumbling rate is really fast, like for water, T2 is really long, okay? So it's got a different dependence on tumbling rate. And what's the reason for that? Well, every little spin is essentially its own magnet, okay? And so if I have one spin here and this is another spin here, they're both processing, right? And they're also tumbling around, right? So that the spin, so this spin here feels the influence of all the spins around it, right? Now, if these spin, if this spin is moving sort of slowly, right, like this, then over time, this spin sort of can sort of, there's sort of a net effect on the rate at which this spin is processing. And it's slightly different from the rate at which this spin's processing. So these spins can sort of feel the effect of this spin here, okay? On the other hand, if this spin is going back and forth like this really fast, on average, it's like it just stayed still, right? Because it's sort of, it's called motional averaging. It's sort of going in so many different directions that over any interval of time that you average it over, it looks like it didn't it just stay here, right? Because if I just, like if this is a spin and it goes slowly, you can sort of see what direction it's in, right? But if I go like this, right, then you would just say, well, on average, it's just here, okay? So on average, this is not gonna have much effect on this rate of precession. So on average, the faster this moves, the less it affects the spins around it, okay? So that's why when tumbling is really fast, T2 is very long because the spins can stay in phase because right, they're really not affecting each other because they're moving so fast that on average, their effect goes to zero. Whereas if spin is very, very, tumbling rate is very slow, like in cartilage or bone, where the spins are really constricted and they can't really do much, then the T2, actually any little motion can cause the spins to process differently. Uh, so that's why you sort of get this range of T2s. And so for water and CSF, you get these long T1s and T2s. And then if you go down to like tendons, look at this, five milliseconds for tendons, 0 0.001 milliseconds for ice proteins. So it means that, um, unfortunately for clinical imaging, it means that um, things like tendons and cartilage and bone are really hard to see on MRI. Uh, now that has changed in part due to a lot of research done at UCSD. In fact, we'll have a special optional lecture next Friday where one of the professors wants to just present some of his research on ultra short echo time imaging. And that's one way of seeing these very short T2 species. Okay, okay so why don't we um, uh, do this problem? So uh, this is a thought problem. Dr. Block has a vial of liquid with T1 equals 1000 and T2 equals 1000. He has some gelatin to the vial, mixes the solution, allows it to gel. What would be reasonable values for the T1 and T2 of the new mixture? I'm going to end the poll and launch a new one. And in class, just feel free to think about this or discuss with your neighbors. And we'll uh, go over this in a few in a minute or two.
Okay, so let's uh, do an in class poll. So on the count of three, just say what you think is the closest answer. One, two, three. Okay, I heard some D, some E, maybe B. So probably more towards D and E and online about 30, 40% D, 40% E. Okay, so let's look at this. So, so the key is it's going from liquid to gel, right? So we know the mobility is decreasing, right? We also know from previous lectures that T2 has to be less than T1. Okay, or less than or equal to. Um, so if mobility is going down, then what do we expect to happen with T2? So also go down, right? <laughs> All right. So we're really looking at, so any of these probably is possible, but this one, T2 is greater than T1, right? And this one, T2 is also greater than T1. So it's probably gonna be one of these two, right? So let's think about it. Is there any way we can tell which one it's gonna be? So we know that there's the sweet points, sweet spot for T1, right? T2 is pretty easy. We know, we know we're gonna go this way, right? On mobility, right? So here um, we say we're a liquid, right? So we're probably out, if we're in water and we're talking about sort of typical uh, lawnmower frequency, we're probably in this regime here. Right, and so if we move down this way, you can imagine we probably be in a regime where T1 is getting smaller, right? But it's somewhat ambiguous, right? Because we don't really know what Lamar frequency we're at. We could have been, you know, in a regime where maybe we're here, which case we would go up this way. Okay. So in this case, since it's an in-class problem, I'm leaving this ambiguity just to point out that in actually you're not given enough information here to really distinguish well between D and E, right? Um, sorry, or sorry, it's, uh, which are the ones that it could be? D or E, right? Yeah. Um, so it could have gone up or it could have gone down. Now, if I really was forced to choose, I probably would pick D simply because given the examples, we free water is out here, liquids are out here and we'd probably be moving into a gel regime here, more the bound water regime, given the field strengths we're talking about. But if we're talking about really low field MRI, then we would have been down here anyways, in which case, go up like that, okay? So it actually, your answer depends, especially if those are you doing portable fMRI or MRI, realize that one thing is that, you know, as you change the field strength, not only are you going to change your signal strength, but you're also moving to new regimes of relaxation rates. And so uh, the rules that apply for standard imaging don't necessarily apply to, um, you know, as you go into low field MRI. Okay. And similarly, as people do high field MRI, they encounter different problems than normal field. Sorry, question there. You, yes. Oh, right. Um, that is a good question. Um, let me uh, look that up some more and, and I'll give you an answer okay, next time. Okay. I could probably make some up, thank God, but I don't wanna do it right now. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, so I think that brings us to end up our time today. So yes, there is class on Wednesday, um, but I know some of you will be gone or flying out. So um, those of you who are still here, look forward to seeing you. Um, so I'll end the recording for now. And then um, those of you who have questions about either projects or the homeworks, I guess homework, oh, I guess the homework is due tonight, right? It, I, so if there's homework questions about homework six, happy to answer those. Or if those anyone has started the new MATLAB homeworks, then happy to answer those questions as well.